presentation on uh, uh, case presentation on uh, metastatic breast cancer. The case will be presented by Dr. Malavi Rao, who is a third year junior resident at Epilepsy Medical Hospital, Kolkata, and Dr. Shomin Das will moderate. Uh, so Malavika has problem with the uh, PowerPoint slides. So uh, Malavika will present, and will uh, Malavika, you wait at the end of uh, uh, history presentation, and then we will discuss a few points, and then pass on to the examination. Malavika, yes, sir. yeah. Okay. Uh, my patient, Mrs. Shraddha, is a 69-year-old lady who is a resident of Kolkata and a, a homemaker by occupation. She presented with the chief complaints of a lump in the left breast for the past two years, a non-healing wound over the left breast for the past one and a half months, and back pain for the past one month. She was apparently well two years ago when she noticed a lump which was insidious in onset and rapidly increasing in size, which she first noticed two years ago while bathing. Since then, it has increased rapidly increased in size to attain the current size. There are no aggravating or relieving factors. Subsequently, she noticed a swelling in the left axilla one and a half years ago without any noticeable change in, uh, in the size. Uh, and one and a half months ago, she noticed a spontaneously developing wound over the left breast, which was increased, uh, uh, which was insidious in onset and, and has increased in size to attain the current size. It is also associated with uh, mild pain and scanty foul smelling bloody discharge. One month ago, she also developed uh, severe lower back pain, which is not related to daily activities and uh, not responding to medications. She also had associated tingling sensation in both, uh, both her legs. Associated uh, along with this, she also had uh, unintended weight loss, approximately nine kilos in the past year, with loss of appetite and weakness. There was no history of fever or trauma to the left breast, no nipple discharge, no lump in any other part of the body, no history of jaundice, new onset cough, severe headache, convulsions, or recent fractures, and there's no history of weakness or limb of uh, weakness of limbs or uh, pus discharge from the non-healing thing. And past history, there is no known intercurrent illness or no medical comorbidity. There are no previous uh, surgeries and no history of prior irradiation to the chest, use of OCPs or uh, oral contraceptive pills or hormonal replacement therapy. And family history, there's no history of breast or ovarian cancer in the first degree relatives or no cancer and no cancer related deaths in the family. <clears throat> Menstrual history, she's postmenopausal. She achieved menarche at the age of 10 years and uh, menopause at the age of 60. And she has two children, the first of which was conceived uh, at, at the age of 21. And she's completed breastfeeding in both children. my uh, history completed. Should I summarize the history? Yes. Okay. Uh, my patient, Mrs. Shraddha, is a 69-year-old lady who came with the chief complaints of a lump in the left breast for the past two years, a non-healing ulcer, non-healing wound over the left breast for the past one and a half months, and back pain for the past month. Uh, she, two years ago, she, uh, she was apparently well and Two years ago, when she noticed a lump in the left breast, which was insidious in onset, rapidly progressing in size to attain the current size. Uh, and uh, there are no aggravating or relieving factors. She also noticed swelling, uh, a swelling in the left axilla one and a half years ago. And uh, one, one and a half, uh, which one and a half years ago. Uh, one and a half months ago, she noticed uh, a, no, a spontaneously developing wound over the the left breast, which was associated with mild pain and uh, scanty foul smelling bloody discharge. And one month ago, she developed severe uh, lower back pain associated with tingling sensation in both legs, not responding to medication. Uh, there is associated history of significant weight loss and uh, loss of appetite and weakness. There's no history of uh, fever, trauma, nipple discharge, lump, in any other part of the body, jaundice, cough, headache, uh, conv convulsions, and weakness of limbs or pus uh, discharge. There is, uh, uh, she's uh, 
in menopause at the age of 60 with two live children uh, first conceived first of which was conceived at the age of 21 and no significant family history okay uh, so from this history what is your provisional diagnosis my provisional diagnosis the lump is likely related uh, is a likely malignant and uh, an advanced malignancy because of involvement of the skin as well as uh, uh, lower back pain and some neuro neurological symptoms of the lower limbs so. okay so you why are you saying this is a malignant breast lump uh, so because she uh, firstly she has no uh, no precipitating history of trauma or fever or pain it's a rapidly pro rapidly growing swelling she's a 69 year old female oh. post menopausal uh, additionally she has uh, lower she has uh, metastatic symptoms which is unintended weight loss and uh, unintended weight loss uh, anorexia and a weakness she also has an uh, involvement of the skin with a foul smelling bloody discharge which is uh, and an axillary lump as well so uh, axillary lump as well okay so what is your uh, uh, staging so at this point my staging would be a metastatic considering her symptoms i would consider a metastatic disease and what kind of malignant malignant lump you are uh, thinking? Is it a carcinoma or a phyloid tumor or a sarcoma? A carcinoma. Carcinoma. So your provisional diagnosis should be it's a carcinoma breast. Okay. Isn't it? Why are you saying this is not a sarcoma, this is a carcinoma? So because uh, there is lymphatic, uh, but from history, there is supposed lymphatic involvement. Would not suspect a sarcoma. Right. right. In case of phyloids, malignant phyloids, uh, the changes which you have mentioned it goes in favor of a malignant carcinoma, I mean, carcinoma of breast because lymph nodal involvement is there. Yes. Right. So, uh, next, what is your staging? So, stage four. From uh, clinical, clinical, the information which you have given, uh, what is your current staging? So without examination, I cannot give the TNM stage, but provisionally stage four disease. Provisionally stage four disease, correct? Because you have mentioned, what are the metastatic symptoms you have mentioned? Uh, so lower back pain with tingling sensation and both legs. Okay, so is it a recent onset lower back pain or uh, she had it uh, since long time? Uh, one and a half months prior to this, she did not have any. Prior to so, okay. So it's a recent onset lower back pain. Oh, where are you suspecting the metastasis to be? Sir, in the lumbar vertebrae. Lumbar vertebra. What is the commonest site of metastasis from breast cancer? Uh, the thoracic and thoracic vertebra. Dorsal lumbar vertebra. Dorsal, yes, dorsal lumbar vertebra. Right. And what about the T stage from history? Uh, so I can't, uh, T stage from history will be T4, uh, uh, T4B. Right, right. Because you said it's a uh, skin is involved. Yes, sir. Fine. So that's that's from history point of view. All right. And, and, and so she has not uh, given a detailed history for the swelling itself. Because you said swelling is rapidly progressing in size up to the current size. You have to mention that what are the swelling size when she first noticed it, patient can show okay. by gesture. And then what is the, you cannot make out what is the size of the lump approximately. Yes. Okay. okay. So you should say okay. the present size of approximately this centimeter. Okay, sir. Okay. And also you should comment that whether she has got any swelling in the neck. Patient complaining okay. axillary swelling may complain of swelling in the neck also because this uh, lymphatic can spread to the uh, supraclavicular nodes also. Yes, sir. Okay. Other, yeah. other history is complete. Yeah. Should I progress to general examination? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, on general examination, um, she's an average woman uh, with a GCS of 15 by 15. Uh, 
she's apyraxial pulse rate is 60 beats per minute regularly regular uh, a normal volumic with no radio radial or radio femoral delay but uh, blood pressure is 130 by 18 millimeters of mercury in the right arm Re uh, respiratory rate is 14 per minute uh, her konovsky per performance score is 60 there is no pallor uh, a pallor is present and no icterus cyanosis clubbing pedal edema or generalized lymphadenopathy axillary uh, examination will be commented upon later uh, JVP was, is within normal limits. Jug jugular venous pressure is within normal limits. On examination of the breast, on inspection, uh, there, it, uh, there is asymmetry between the both uh, breasts noted with the left breast, which is significantly larger than the right. The nipple areola complex of the left breast is deviated downwards and outwards. There is, um, there is a large mass in the left breast involving the from involving the regions from seven o'clock to two o'clock region that is the upper and inner quadrants uh, approximately 10 centimeter by seven centimeter in size the mass has irregular margins lobulated surface and the skin over the swelling is unhealthy and uh, dirty especially around the ulcer there is a single five, five centimeter by five centimeter ulcer from nine, involving nine o'clock to 12 o'clock position region with irregular margins, inverted edges. The floor is formed by unhealthy granulation tissue. And there is pore orange from seven o'clock to eight o'clock position. That is the lower inner quadrant. There are no satellite nodules and uh, the left nipple area complex is abnormal in position but appears normal otherwise and uh, the left breast does not fall away from the chest wall on bending when the patient bends forward the right breast appears to be normal bilateral axillae supraclavicular region and the neck appears to be normal on palpation uh, of the left breast the, there is a single non-tender hard mass, 10 centimeter by seven centimeter in size, involving seven o'clock to two o'clock position, which is the upper and inner quadrants. The overlying, there is an overlying ulcer uh, from seven o'clock to, uh, from nine o'clock to 12 o'clock position, which is five centimeter by five centimeter in size, non-tender, and uh, there are no satellite lesions. It has irregular margins, inverted edges, uh, fluid is formed by unhealthy granulation tissue. The base of the ulcer is indurated and uh, attached to the breast tissue. Uh, there is serosanguinous foul smelling discharge from the ulcer. There is uh, no dip nipple discharge on uh, pressing, the, uh, pressing the swelling. Uh, the mass appears to be involving this, uh, the mass is involving the skin, breast tissue, and the chest wall. The nipple areola complex of the left breast is normal, right breast is uh, normal, and in the left axilla, there is, on palpation of the left axilla, there is palpable palpable lymph nodes of the, uh, of the anterior group, central group, and the apical groups, which are non-tender, non-matted, and have limited mobility. The left axilla is normal. Uh, the, there is no cha no edematous changes in either hand of the patient, upper limb. Should I stop here or should I go finish the systemic examination? Mm, complete, girl. complete. Okay. On systemic examination, the abdomen uh, is uh, is normal. Uh, the soft, non-tender, with no distension or no organomegaly. The umbilicus is normal in position and inverted. The hernial orifice is normal. In the respiratory system, there is bilateral equal vesic uh, vesicular breath sounds and no, ad no added sounds. Uh, the, uh, in, in the nervous system, uh, there is no focal neurological deficit. In the uh, examination of the spine, there is uh, uh, An examination of the, uh, I'm sorry, so once again, an examination of the spine, there is uh, no bony prominence or uh, 
discontinuity in the uh, vertebral spaces with no uh, decrease in size of the uh, vertebral spaces. A leg raising test is uh, on straight leg raising test, there is uh, significant pain at uh, the Burgess angle is less than 30 degrees. Bandage angle? When you raise the, raise the legs uh, 30, uh, up to 30 degrees, there is significant pain that's experienced by the patient. So she could not lift her legs for more than 30 degrees from the base. You finish up. We'll discuss. Yes, other systemic examination is normal, except for examination of the spine and lower limbs. Could you please describe the ulcer again? Uh, so the ulcer is a five by cent five centimeter non-tender ulcer, which is uh, occupying nine o'clock, twelve o'clock position. That is the inner upper uh, upper inner quadrant. Mm. Um, there, are a, it's a single ulcer with no satellite lesions. There is irregular margins, everted edges, and the floor is formed by unhealthy granulation tissue. The base of the ulcer is indurated, and there is serosanguinous foul smelling discharge from the ulcer. Right, good. And what about the axillary tissue? You mentioned they are non matted, mobile. Non matted with limited mobility and non tender. Okay. All right. Any any uh, any neck swelling, supraclavicular nodes? No, sir. Uh, supraclavicular regions, the right axilla and the neck are not. All right. What about the condition of um, ipsilateral arm? Ipsilateral arm, sir, is normal. There is no edema noted. No brony. Uh, no brony edema. All right. <clears throat> why why the examination of arm is separately to be mentioned? Uh, so when there is lymphadenopathy, there is a high chance that the patient will develop lymphedema in the uh, ipsilateral arm. And that adds to the comorbidity in uh, surgery as well. Right, right. So that is to be noted. And what is the condition of inframammary fold? Is that area clean? Uh, is, is there any lump in the inframammary fold? There was no palpable lump in the inframammary fold. Right. So these are the areas during the examination of breast, you have to mention separately that okay. uh, the arm is okay, the supraclavicular region is okay. And uh, did you did you park us over the sternum? Uh, no, sir. I did not do that. Yes. Uh, why, why that is important? How do you clinically identify the internal memory group of lymph nodes? Uh, so the internal memory group of... Uh, the internal memory group of lymph nodes will be uh, present in the lateral border of the sternum on either side. So right. if, if we go along the edge, lateral border of the edges, we'll be able to palpate the... the no, you cannot palpate. You cannot internal, palpate. internal memory nodes are not palpable. In thin patients? No, no, <laughs> not even thin patients because they are lying behind the, the rib cage. But... Usually it is not palpable. Unless you have very large feeling, that is different. But uh, okay. usually... Internal memory nodes are not assessed by palpation. Okay, sir. you can have a percussion where you may, but that is also difficult to appreciate the dullness. Yes, yes. but it is yes. always by always by imaging. Okay, sir. You said the lump is fixed to the chest wall. How have you ascertained that? Uh, sir, on inspection, when the patient uh, uh, was bending forwards, the left breast was not falling away from the chest wall, and uh, on Contracting the pectoralis minor muscle, uh, the no, lump no, no, became. No, no. You said you said lump is fixed to the chest wall. Do you at all need to contract the pectoralis muscle? No, sir. But no, you need not. Need. You have to say that when you try to move the lump without muscle being taut. Okay. A relaxed state, you try to move the lump is fixed as such. That implies that the lump is fixed to the Chest wall. It did not ask the patient to contract the pectoralis to demonstrate chest wall fixing. Fine. Yes, sir. 
Right. So, what is T four A? So T four A is uh, extension to the chest wall. Uh, that is uh, involvement of the pectoralis muscle. No. But uh, not pectoralis. Chest wall is not pectoralis. Chest wall is what? Chest wall is reeve intercostal muscles and the serratus. And the pectoralis fixity does not alter T staging. Yes. Okay. Right. Only involvement of pectoralis doesn't alter T staging. Remember okay. this. Okay. Okay. Okay, sir. How do you check for uh, serratus anterior uh, fixity? Uh, so first we uh, palpate the patient, uh, palpate the lump when the muscle is relaxed and uh, check the mobility of the lump. Then we will ask the patient to push against a wall uh, or against our hand and then try, uh, that is, that makes a serratus anterior taut and then we will try to uh, move the muscle. If the, uh, move the lump in the direction of the muscle and against the direction of the muscle, if there is no mobility when the muscle is taut, then that in, indicates that there is involvement of the serratus anterior. Right. So for ascertaining any fixity to any muscle, First, you move the tumor without contracting the muscle. That's the same principle for pectoralis major, for serratus, and etc. So, if you cannot move it, even keeping the muscle relaxed, that means it has gone beyond the muscle, deep to the muscle, isn't it? Yes. So, so for uh, seeing a chest wall fixity, uh, if you keep the pectoralis major muscle relaxed, and if you still find that it is not mobile, and when you ask the patient to uh, stoop forward, yes, if you find that that ipsilateral breast is not falling down, that means the chest wall fixity is there. Yes. All right. And what do you mean by skin involvement? Or what is uh, this to be? Uh, skin involvement is uh, ulceration or satellite nodules, or even body orange of that uh, of the skin is. Uh, right. What is skin tethering? So when the corpus ligament uh, are involved by the tumor, then there will be, uh, when the patient lifts, the, lifts her hand above her head, there will be a thing of the skin which is called skin tethering. Uh, how do you clinically test for skin tethering? That's the inspectory finding you have mentioned. Now, yes. can, you, can you do some palpatory method by which you can see skin tethering is there? And if it is at all present, is that clinically relevant? Does it alter mm -hmm. T staging? No, uh, no, sir, it doesn't alter no. T staging. Yes, yes. It doesn't alter T staging, but we try and to move happened? the skin separate from the. If you push the lump, if you push the lump, what is made obvious to say that yes, there is a, a possibility of skin tethering? This puckering of the skin, sir. Yes, dimpling. Dimpling. Dimpling it. So, if you have a lump like this, if you try to move it this way, mm -hmm. the puckering or dimpling will appear not here in the lump. It will appear somewhere else because the pull of the Cooper's ligament, yes. you know. So, that's called skin tethering, but it has got nothing to do with T staging. Okay. okay. What is PUD orange? Uh, so, PUD orange is in involvement of the uh, subdermal lymphatics. And there is involvement of subdermal lymphatics. Uh, the skin becomes edematous, but the hair follicles will uh, cause indentation on the skin and cause an appearance like an orange skin, which is why it's called poly. Right. And this PUD orange is very important because it will alter your T staging. T staging. T4B. Right. And uh, what about your clinical axillary staging? Uh, so clinically, my axillary staging is uh, C uh, uh, N two, which is N two. Why uh, are you saying no. it is N two? N two because there is involvement of the level one and level two lymph nodes, but they're not matching. No, no. Uh, clinically, no, it's not because of one and two. Right. You said some more points. Multiple nodes, Dead. and you said no. restricted. Restricted mobility, sir. Yeah. So see, okay. ipsilateral axillary mobile, that is N1. Ipsilateral axillary mobile is N1. 
ipsilateral hmm. axillary fixed or matted that is n2 hmm. and n3 is when you have supraclavicular so for all practical purpose remember these three only these three clinical staging because uh, ascertaining internal mammary group clinically is very difficult it's mostly an imaging imaging finding but still if you get a uh, definite dullness during palpation uh, percussion of the sternal wall of uh, sternum of that side uh, any star now of that side. Uh, so there only you can comment that internal memory is involved. Otherwise, internal memory, uh, uh, identifying internal memory lymph node in clinical practice is very difficult. So for all practical purpose, what you can get, you can get an axillary node which is mobile. So this is N1. You can get an axillary node which is fixed or matted, that is N2. And if you have a supraclavicular node in presence or in absence of axillary node, this N3. Okay. okay. So clinically, only these three you can ascertain. Now, what is okay. fixity and what is matting? Uh, so matting is when the lymph nodes all join together and uh, they form one. It, it appears to be one single lymph node which moves all together. And fixity is when it does not. It's, it's not. There are separate lymph nodes, but there are no. But there. Are not mobile not, not mobile. mobile so they are fixed to some other structures yes. when the lymph nodes they are fixed to fixed with each other it's called matting and when the lymph node is fixed to some other structures like uh, the axillary uh, medial wall or in the anterior axillary fold or posterior axillary fold it's called fixity all right what is the disease where you very commonly find matting of lymph nodes tuberculosis tuberculosis correct correct um, you can show me, you can pass on the management. Yes, last day so, we discussed some part of clinical. So, today right. we'll discuss the mainly management of workup and uh, the planning right. of treatment for this patient, right? So, how do you how do you con want to confirm your diagnosis? Uh, sir, I would like to complete the triple assessment. I would like to obtain a biopsy from the no, no, don't jump to biopsy first. Triple assessment is history of examination of done. Next is not biopsy, next is imaging. Imaging, bilateral uh, mammography. Yeah. And and it depends. Uh, a patient is 69 years. I'm sorry, sir. I lost connection for a second. You, you don't, after a clinic examination, is not biopsy. It should be imaging. Imaging. Oh. So before that, uh, can you just tell me your diagnosis in a um, uh, single yeah. sentence? Ah, <clears throat> my, my diagnosis is uh, carcinoma of the left breast, which is of the clinical staging T2, uh, sorry, T4C, N2, M1, and uh, in a 69 year old postmenopausal woman. Right. 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 Uh, uh, Shoman, can she right. say M1? Because uh, clinically, uh, there are some symptoms of. Uh, uh, bony symptoms, but they are not specific of metastatic disease. 69 years lady may have associated uh, this, but clinically, yes, strong suspicion is very high, but unless investigated, I think uh, at the end of clinical examination, it's difficult to conclude that patient has got M1 disease. Okay. Right, sir. Right. Uh, I agree. I fully agree with sir. Uh, because the only point she mentioned, this uh, low back pain is a very recent onset low back pain. Yes. In the 69 years, uh, if if the low back pain is there for one year or two years, I would have said, uh, don't mention that there is metastatic symptom. But since it's a recent onset low back pain, okay. uh, along along with some uh, neuropathies in the lower limb, uh, we may consider this as a. But it has to be uh, confirmed by by yeah. by. Uh, okay. right. So should I mention it as likely metastasis to the vertebra? Yeah, clinically, see, if you have a <laughs> clinical staging, you can mention it. You can directly mention it also. No issues okay. there. You have to stand that, yes, this is a since this is a recent onset low back pain. He yeah. has a lower limb neuropathy. That's why I am. I have a strong suspicion of uh, yeah. metastasis to lumbar yeah. body. Huh. This okay. because uh, history is from uh, a short onset of... Yes. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. Right, okay. So, what is the principle? 
Mammography. Mammography, yes, sir. Yeah. Any role for sonography in the uh, axilla or? Uh, uh, sir, we can get a sonography of the axilla because uh, we will need. This patient has got an obvious disease. Yes, sir. Said, multiple limb nodes, matted, uh, restricted mobility. Yes. Okay. So in and, uh, in in triple assessment, when yes. do you do a mammography or when do you do a um, uh, ultrasonography? Uh, so sonography is preferred in younger females because the breast has more fibrous tissue than adipose tissue. So mammography will lead to false uh, positive, uh, false negative results. So we would like prefer an ultrasonography in the uh, the guideline is less than forty or forty five years. Uh, we would prefer an uh, ultrasonography, and older than that, we would prefer a mammography. So. so see, this age criteria is uh, not a hard and fast rule that below. Uh, 40 you will do uh, ultrasonography always and at 41 you will always do a mammography it's a altogether all, all a supplementary kind of thing it depends on the breast density you know okay. so if you have a denser breast where you suspect that more and more fatty tissue uh, <laughs> less amount of uh, 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 breast tissue is there so there that that's why the mammography is little difficult there because that will create a false impression you know the fat is fat acts as a, uh, a, a black tissue where your delineation is not there right so for by and large older people uh, where the breast density is different we go for a mammography and for younger people we go for an ultrasonography but remember for older people also along with mammography ultrasonography is also done most of the cases, ultrasonography is also done. Why? Why? Uh, so for uh, to get a clinical guideline and if to uh, to rule out other possibilities of not in, in in such an obvious case, maybe it's not required. But if there is just a palpable lump or even an impalpable lump with axillary swellings, then an uh, ultrasound of the breast would be helpful in guiding. Them. And, yes. and also, if you are planning for a biopsy, it is better to have an image-guided, ultrasound-guided biopsy. Yes. Right. Uh, so, what is the commonest benign breast disorder in a 69 years female? Hello? Y yes. What is the commonest, commonest benign breast disorder in a 69 years female? Oh. Am I audible? Yes. It's cutting off, sir. Uh, so, what is the commonest, commonest benign breast disorder in a 69 years female? Is it fibroadenoma? Is it fibroadenosis? Or a breast cyst? Uh, sir, cyst is more likely. Fibroadenoma is more common in younger females. Yes, right. So, macro cysts are a very common entity. Here, you got a definite ulceration, but where you get a palpable lump in a 69 years lady, so macro cyst is a possibility, which is very difficult to mm, delineate in mammography. But a simple ultrasound will tell you whether it is cystic or not. So ultrasound sometimes helps you to diagnose the disease as well as to guide your sampling. Suppose you have a complex cyst. Some part is solid, some part is uh, cystic. So there, yes. it's, if you have an ultrasound guidance to take your biopsy, it will help you uh, to get a biopsy in a proper way. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so not only that, not only that, uh, to see your axilla and as well as axillary uh, sampling, uh, you can get uh, ultrasonography. Okay, so that's your radiological part of the triple assessment. Then what you do, want to do? Uh, sir, I would like to get a core biopsy of the lung as well as the axillary swelling uh, to axillary uh, lymph nodes. Core biopsy and of the primary as well as core biopsy of the axillary lymph nodes. Lymph nodes. Okay. So why do you want to do a core biopsy? Why don't you want to do a FNAC? So this is a very obvious disease. So a uh, core biopsy will give me... Uh, will additionally be able to give me uh, hormonal, uh, hormonal receptor statuses, ER, PR, and HER2 new as well, which FNAC will not be able to provide. 
Right. So core biopsy has a diff better sensitivity and specificity in comparison to FNAC. This is number one. Number two, in core biopsy, you will get a tissue. In FNAC, you will get a cell. You will get some cells, right? So obviously, your chance of getting diagnosing the disease properly is higher in core biopsy. Number three, in core biopsy, you can get an ERPR heart to new or receptor status done, right? So these are the advantages of core biopsy over FNAC. Now for axillary lesion, is it mandatory to go for core biopsy? So it's not necessary, but to get an additional, uh, uh, in such a uh, obvious disease, maybe not, but in less obvious diseases, we should get it to see if it's a reactive lymph node and a lymphadenopathy or if it is metastatic. Right, for <clears throat> axillary nodal status, it is not a mandatory to go for a core biopsy if you have if you have done a proper core biopsy of the breast lesion there are certain situations where you get a more axillary lump with an unknown primary you don't have any uh, lesion in the breast but you patient presented with axillary mass there you do a core biopsy of the axillary mass but when you have a definite lesion in the breast you need to just confirm whether your axillary nodes are metastatic or not for that, an ultrasound uh, ultrasound guided FNAC is sufficient. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Okay. So, core biopsy you want to do. That's fine. Now, what are the informations you'd like to have from core biopsy? Uh, sir, in the, of the primary? Of the primary. Of the primary. Of the primary, I would like to know if there is any... Uh, of a hormonal receptor status that is yeah, before ER that, status before, before that, that histology before that uh, histology i would histology you can infer there are things to look for uh, if there is any uh, uh, the invasive or non invasive uh, lymphoma or carcinoma uh, or phyloids and uh, Additionally, I would like to see if it is carcinoma, I would like to look for any uh, lymphovascular or perineural invasion. And uh, finally, the hormonal status, ER, ER status, PR status. Before that, grade. Before that grading. You can, you can grade oh, great. histology. Grading. Yes, okay. Grading of tumor. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yes. So, first of all, is the diagnosis number one whether it is a ductal carcinoma or a lobular carcinoma, whether it is phyllaries or everything. Uh, then you need to know the grading of the disease. Now, why? Yeah. What? 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 Uh, hormonal parameters and other parameters you would like to see? PR status, GR status, her two new status, uh, as well as uh, KI sixty seven. Uh, why so uh if if the if the tumor is er and pr positive hmm. then uh, we will give hormonal therapy and if it is er pr negative and her tumor positive then we can give uh, trastuzumab or uh, 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 so what is luminal classification of breast cancer i don't know sir. Okay, what are the, how do you, based on these four parameters, uh, uh, how do you classify uh, these breast cancers based on these four parameters? Uh, sir, uh, luminal A is... Uh, yeah. In anyway, luminal A is harmonization of positive. Malavika, you are not audible. Yeah. You have muted yourself, I think. Uh, ah, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Carry on. So I, I, I'm, I'm blanking out on the classification. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, luminal A is... Uh, ER positive and PR positive, but negative for HER2. Uh, luminal B is ER positive, PR positive, and uh, 
her two was positive group 3 is her two positive but erp are negative and uh, group 4 is triple negative yeah uh, so luminal a is when you have a hormone positive disease her two negative luminal b is mostly hormone positive her two negative with a high ki 67 you know okay. the difference between luminal a b is Uh, in luminal a you have a low ki 67 in luminal b you have a high ki 67 so okay. high proliferation index is there the third group is a hard to enrich group okay. where you have a hard to positive disease you may have a hormone positive disease along with this you may have a hormone negative disease along with this all right so triple positive and uh, erp are negative and hard to new positive goes group falls in the hard to enrich group all right and the uh, fourth group is the tnbc you have mentioned that is also known as a basal like group okay so this classification is very 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 important nowadays not only in metastatic setting but also in this, uh, patients where you are planning a new adjuvant chemotherapy okay so any tumor nowadays any tumor in the breast where you are suspecting a breast malignancy assessment of these four parameters are very important because not only for your malignant uh, uh, metastatic disease if you have a node positive disease you see nowadays in tnbcs and hard to positive disease if you have a single node positive disease you have a immense advantage of giving new adjuvant chemotherapy in these patients okay so i am not going into details of those cases because uh, today we are dealing with a metastatic breast carcinoma so uh, so after after doing an core biopsy suppose your patient is erpr positive hard to new negative now what what next you want to do what next investigation you have done a triple assessment You have completed yes, the triple assessment. Yes, Now, sir. what next do you want to do? So, I would like to do a metastatic workup for this patient. Uh, okay. What uh, metastatic workup you want to do? Uh, so, I would like to do a chest uh, CT scan of the uh, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, oh. and additionally a DEXA scan. Uh, in this particular patient, I would also like to get a X-ray of the. Uh, Uh, thoracic dorsal uh, dorsal lumbar spine and uh, yes and if and sometimes it and a dexa scan why don't you want to do a pet ct scan yes a pet ct can also be done if it's available in this yeah so standard of care for a um, uh, metastatic disease where you have clinically strong suspicion of metastatic disease uh, it it's it's better to go for a pet ct scan PET-CT. where pet ct scan where you will find uh, the definite metastatic areas where you have suspected you may get some uh, unpleasant surprises also this patient may have a pulmonary metastasis this patient may have a, a liver metastasis all right so detection of metastasis standard of care is to go for a pet scan now there is a controversy that whether i should do pet scan is in all uh, cases of metastatic breast cancer or, or all cases of breast cancer so suppose your patient is having a 2 cm tumor clinically node negative what is the standard of care in metastatic uh, work that means what are the tests you would like to do to see whether your uh, patient is metastatic or not a 2 cm tumor early breast cancer that is scenario of early breast cancer hello yes yes yeah. okay so could you please skip yes yes question. what i wanted to ask you you have suspected a metastatic disease clinically here yes, you are doing a pet scan if you okay. have a early breast cancer what is the standard protocol for metastatic workup so in early breast cancer the new nccn guidelines say that in early breast cancer if there is no symptoms of metastatic uh, metastasis then it is not routine to do a metastatic uh, workup but starting from nuclear advanced breast cancer that is stage to uh, stage t uh, Age three onwards, we would uh, definitely like to do a metastatic workup. Right, and the standard of care in metastatic workup is a PET scan, number one. 
Number two, where you don't have the facility of PET scan, is you can substitute with this with a CT, thorax, abdomen, pelvis, and a whole body bone scan. Right? Yes, sir. And uh, you see in NCCN guideline also, there is a special uh, subset for resource constrained countries where you don't have the facility of bone, uh, I mean, uh, PET scan or CT, you can get away with a chest x ray, ultrasonography, yes, abdomen, and a bone scan. But that yes. is not a standard of care where you don't have the facility for others. So, for metastatic workup, number one is the PET scan you can do. Number two, where you don't have the facility of PET scan, you go for a CT thorax, abdomen, pelvis along with a bone scan. Number three, where you don't have all these facilities, there you can do a chest x ray and ultrasonography also. Right. Am I clear? Yes, sir. So, suppose you have done a PET CT and your patient is having uh, metastasis in the lungs and bone. Yes, both. lungs and bones. What okay. should be your approach? And the background of a lump in the breast with fungation. What should be your plan of treatment in this patient? Right. Uh, uh, so for the bony metastasis, uh, we, so we will first involve the multi uh, get all of their advice as well as the patients. What is the aim of treatment in this patient? So the aim of treatment is uh, uh, it, it will be we want to treat with intent to cure, but we will have to, uh, intent to cure in this patient with the lung yeah. and uh, bone metastasis. There is no question of intent of cure in this patient. Intent to treat, but uh, we will we will have to counsel the patient that there might not be a, a complete. No, no. On the back, we have given a scenario. The patient has got pulmonary and particular metastasis. Yeah. So we are the patient who are not curable. You can provide good palliation. Okay, the okay. intent treatment is palliation here. You cannot say you can have intent of cure in a patient who has got stage four carcinoma of the lung and uh, bone metastasis. Yes. So, what are the areas of your treatment here? Patient has got a lump in the breast with fungation, a vertebral metastasis symptoms, but permanent metastasis is not symptomatic. And so, uh, for the breast, we will uh, we can offer the patient a toilet mastectomy. Oh, you said the lump is tissue chest 12. If the lump is chest 12, can you offer a, a, a palliative mastectomy? Uh, so just to the to a toilet mastectomy in order no, to... No, no. How do you go about it? You have a large ulcer in the breast. You said periodic range, lump is tissue chest 12. Why should you jump to the surgery straight away? What should be the optimal planning in this patient? Dr. Dash, what do you think? Should she yes, go yes. for a mastectomy? No, in a background no, 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 no. No, that's our last resort. This is a uh, treatment naive patient. That means your patient has not did not receive any sort of chemotherapy beforehand, isn't it? Yeah. It's a treatment naive patient. So remember, um, uh, in a metastatic breast cancer, we usually divide metastatic breast cancer into oligometastasis versus polymetastatic disease. All right? Okay. Okay. So by and large, all the metastatic breast cancers, are the intention of treatment is usually palliative. Am I clear? Most of the cancers, when you have a stage 4 disease, the intention of treatment is, okay. most of the cases, palliative. But breast cancer is the only exception where you have a oligometastatic disease or a bone-only metastatic disease. Yeah you can treat the patient with a curative intent, provided you have a ERPR positive disease and a heart to new negative disease. That means a luminal A type of thing. Am I clear? Okay. So yes. the scenario which Sir has given, where you have a pulmonary metastasis as well as bony metastasis. In this scenario, it's a polymetastatic disease. So in a polymetastatic disease, your intention of treatment should be palliative. And what do you mean by a palliative treatment? Palliative, by meaning palliative treatment is you don't have an uh, intention to cure the patient, but, but to give a patient a good quality of life and to prolong the life as far as possible. So that's the intention of palliative treatment. Am I clear? Yes. So here in this patient, remember, uh, 
this ulcer is a malignant ulcer i understand yes. that this ulcer is creating a problem in the local area but the patient is treatment naive this ulcer can be treated with chemotherapy only you can start okay. with chemotherapy all right okay and this chemotherapy is called palliative chemotherapy yes sir after giving few cycles of chemotherapy you see the whether the ulcer is responding or not in a vast majority of cases when you start chemotherapy after few previously we used to think that ulceration is a contraindication for chemotherapy so that is not am i clear even the patient is having a breast ulceration you start off with chemotherapy and in these patients if the patient is erpr positive hart to new negative then the choice of chemotherapy is usually a taxin based chemotherapy if the patient is having a uh, hormone uh, negative and hart to positive disease then you should add uh, trastuzumab or pertuzumab along with your standard chemotherapy backbone am i clear so targeted therapy plus chem chemotherapy so these are there are there are lot of options in chemotherapy in a metastatic breast cancer based on based on the hormone receptor positivity based on your hart to new status am i clear so okay, this patient needs a chemotherapy plus minus targeted therapy your answer should be i would like to start chemotherapy plus minus targeted therapy based on the erp hart to new status clear okay. yes. so yes. you start off with chemotherapy remember the only area where you can start with radiotherapy first is the symptoms related to the vertebral meds if the metastatic area is too much symptomatic patient cannot walk patient is in uh, paraparesis patient has severe pain in the low back region there you can start off with the palliative radiotherapy also okay am i clear so yes, if sir. the patient is too much symptomatic for the vertebral metastasis you give the patient with you start off the patient with palliative radiotherapy and this palliative radiotherapy is usually single fraction or 3 to 4 fraction five fractions am i clear so a small fraction palliative radiotherapy to the most symptomatic bone along with that you put the patient on jolidronic acid have you heard of jolidronic acid uh it's used for a bisphosphonate yes it's a it's a bisphosphonate yes. so which will take care of the bone health am i clear now yes, to, before you start this targeted therapy or chemotherapy mm -hmm. you have to assess patient's general condition patient's cardiac fitness because all these trastuzumab pertuzumab they are cardiotoxic Cardi so the first decision is whether to start there, there is no question of surgery at this moment Am I clear? So you have option of going for chemotherapy only, chemotherapy with targeted therapy, or radiotherapy to the most symptomatic area. Okay. So first you assess the pain score of the patient. If the pain is too much, patient is a vast score of more than eight, then you start off with palliative radiotherapy. It will take one week time. After that. you check the patient's cardiac fitness and etc you start off with either chemotherapy or a targeted therapy now if you find patient is unfit for any major intervention and patient is hormone hormone positive there you can start off with hormone therapy only in these metastatic patients also because patients who are very post menopausal strongly hormone positive you start off with hormone therapy only you there is a uh, clear consensus on that also now how do okay, you sir. define oligometastatic disease uh, so when there is uh, metastasis to only one uh, one uh, other organ system then it count as oligometastasis there is more than one then it's suppose one. suppose you have bone metastasis at uh, sacrum bone metastasis at dorsal lumbar vertebra as well as in the uh, thoracic vertebra hmm. one system is involved no, so. one system is not oligo depends on the number of metastasis number of metastasis you know otherwise it it would have been a monometastatic disease if you say only single metastasis i'm uh, saying uh, oligo means less isn't yes. it poly means multiple so usually they take as less than five metastasis 
five sites of metastasis or by and large low volume metastatic disease low volume metastatic disease okay, okay so that's called oligome oligometastatic disease now coming to the role of surgery in stage 4 or a metastatic disease so the uh, the term you used toilet mastectomy is nowadays not a yeah. very well practice or uh, uh, standard terminology we call it palliative mastectomy Okay, yes, the mastectomy you were talking about is known as palliative mastectomy. It's not toilet mastectomy. It looks very odd. You take out the breast and flush it in toilet. It comes like that. So not that's not true. So it's called palliative mastectomy. Now you tell me what are the indications of palliative mastectomy in a stage four uh, breast cancer? Uh, so when there is ulceration or fungation and there any wound uh, wound related complications. Uh, skin skin related complications if there is a large tumor which is causing which in itself is causing a uh, certain uh, uh, which is causing uh, the patient any trouble then we can do a palliative mastectomy right so palliative mastectomy indications are when you have a large fungating mass which mm -hmm. is causing which is causing patients discomfort the quality of life is being hampered due to that mass and this mass is not reducing, getting reduced by standard chemotherapeutic regimes. Okay. Am I clear? So if you have yes, a fungating mass, you the first thing you do is not to go for a surgery. If you have a metastatic disease in background, you start off with chemotherapy first or plus okay. minus targeted therapy based on um, heart to new status. You okay. wait for three to four cycles. You see whether this mass is responding or not. Many, yes. the, most of the times, the mass is going to shrink down. The ulcer is going to heal with the chemotherapy only. If it doesn't heal, even after three, four, six cycles of chemotherapy, and the patient is in discomfort, patient is feeling pain, the quality of life is uh, really hampered. In that case. In that case, you go for a palliative mastectomy. There, you don't touch the axilla. You just remove the breast. Okay. You just remove the breast. Now you tell me, what are the indications of curative mastectomy in a stage 4 breast cancer? So, I am contradicting myself. Right yes. now, I said in a stage 4 disease, you don't have any chance of doing mastectomy. So, are you aware of any trial where this curative mastectomy was tested in a background of stage 4 breast cancer and what are the results of those trials i don't know so because you are presenting a metastatic breast cancer i'll tell you no no issues uh, but you should remember these two trials one is called m1 trial which was done by professor rajendra badawe from tata m1 <laughs> trial and it was published in uh, lancet Another trial called Turkish trial. These two trials, they have tested the role of curative mastectomy in a stage 4 breast cancer patient where the expected life expectancy is more than one year. Am I clear? I'll tell you a situation. Suppose this is your patient only. She has only bone metastasis. Okay? No lung yes, metastasis. You start with chemotherapy. Now, okay. after six cycles of chemotherapy, the bone mass, uh, you do a PET scan because of response assessment, you have to do a PET scan. Yes, sir. You do a PET scan, you find the breast lesion has healed. There is only a two centimeter uh, scar area which is showing uptake. Bone metastasis. There is no bone metastasis in a follow up PET scan. Now, you tell me in this situation, what are you going to do? Six cycles of chemotherapy. After six cycles of chemotherapy, you find the bone mass is uh, has vanished, and you have only a residual disease in the breast. Uh, so, if, if since there is response to treatment, we can try for the curative mastectomy, MRM, modified radical mastectomy. Yes. So these are the areas where they have tested good prognostic patients, ERP are positive. So the M1 trial has clearly mentioned, they have done a properly randomized control trial by Professor Badwe. They have 
taken over uh, 500 patients in each group and compared role of palliative mastectomy in these patients where you have a very good response and your life expectancy is more than one year. They did not find any survival benefit by doing a mastectomy in a patient like this. Okay. Am I clear? So there yes, is sir. no survival benefit. Hmm. There is another trial called Turkish trial where they have found some survival benefit okay. by doing a palliative mastectomy, uh, uh, by doing a curative mastectomy in patients who have responded well with after chemotherapy. Okay. 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 But, but, the, but the message is the uh, results are strong. If you have a ERPR positive, that means a luminal A group with a good response to chemotherapy. There only you have a chance of getting some survival benefit. But before telling this, let me uh, um, summarize the whole thing. The role of curative surgery in a stage 4 breast cancer. As per M1 trial, there is no survival benefit across all the luminal subtypes, all the molecular subtypes. Am I clear? Okay. So that's okay. the first message. So if you have a patient who started with metastatic disease after chemotherapy, still metastatic, there is no question of, there is no question of surgery. Am I clear? Only palliative mastectomy is indicated if the patient is having a fungating mass and the quality of life is being hampered. But okay. in, as per Turkey's trial, we can do surgery in a select group of patients where you find the hormonal parameters are favorable. That means ERPR positive, HER2 new negative, and the patient has oligometastatic disease, and the patient responded very well to standard palliative chemotherapy protocol. So if your patient fulfills these three criteria, then you need to counsel the patient adequately that look, I can do surgery in you. In uh, we can we can do a mastectomy in your patient, but the possible survival benefit it is not very clear. After doing surgery, we may improve your survival uh, as per the Turkish trial. So this should be your uh, proper statement. Am I clear? Okay, sir. Right. So this patient needs counseling for management in such situation. Because in the options, both are correct. If you don't do surgery for the oh. primary, you keep on waiting and see if the patient comes up with more metastatic disease, or you can offer surgery. So uh, counseling is important in such situation. Yeah. I think, uh, Shuman, we have... Uh, so time is up, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think Thank most you. of... There are, some more thing, Isha Malika, there are some more things to be seen in this patient because uh, these are the patients who may not respond to standard chemotherapy. These are the okay. patients who may not respond to the first time of hormone therapy. So there are a mm -hmm. lot of things that come up. A uh, lot of newer drugs has come up. Uh, um, some more tests in the form of uh, uh, testing for um, some uh, gene mutations which can drive the further treatment. Anna, so, I mean, so, yes, uh, just, uh, just a one line. Uh, yeah. In this situation, uh, initially, this ERPR hard to new is standard of care. Uh, you can add there is something called NGS, next gene, next gene sequencing. That means that's a test which you can do from your uh, this uh, core biopsy specimen only. NGS will give you several other targets. You know, like hard to new, you will have other targets based on which you can choose your second line chemotherapy or second line targeted therapy. Yeah. But for initial metastatic breast cancer, the ERPR, HER2 and uh, KI67 is sufficient because if you have a um, uh, complete response, you might not get tissue again. So from this tissue, you can go for NGS. That's a newer development. NGS will give you several other targets based on which if the patient records, I mean, uh, progresses on your standard chemotherapy, yeah. then you can select your second line chemotherapy or second line targeted therapy based on NGS. So by and large, that's all. I think in metastatic breast cancer, the message should be if you have polymetastatic disease, the intention is always palliative. If you have an oligometastatic disease, you can treat the patient with a curative intent. Yeah. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you, Rodak. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you sir.